thank you for tuning in with us today for our first chat from our Beyond Backstage series, part of our 2020 fall digital season. In a few hours after the release of this video, you'll be able to watch Symphony 21's performance of Edward Elgar's Serenade for Strings. What is remarkable about our season is that this work is the only piece from the standard repertoire on our program this fall. Obviously, we recorded it in decidedly non-standard times with lots of social distancing, masks, sanitizer, and other safety precautions that made the process of rehearsing and recording such a well-known work extremely different, we'll say. Uh, in that vein, I'll be speaking with our guests today about how they are coping with these non-standard times. To talk a little bit about how 2020 is changing the game for large venues, we have Wendy Atkinson, the Rentals and Programming Manager at the Chan Center for the Performing Arts. Lon Cohen Mann, who was named one of Canada's top 30 under 30 classical musicians for 2020 by CBC Music, and a very accomplished oboist and oboe content creator on YouTube, will be speaking to how freelance musicians are finding new avenues of music making. And last but not least, Dr. Jonathan Gerard, Director of Orchestras and Professor of Conducting at the University of British Columbia, who will be sharing what the new standard is for educators and students. Uh, hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank Hello, Jalem. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with Wendy. So venues, in many ways, are the bedrock of the arts industry. Performers, after all, need somewhere to perform. Given, the digital perform given that digital performances has become the gold standard during COVID and how everyone is communicating with audiences, um, how has the Chance Center adapted to those times? Well, with the Chance Center has had to adapt uh, for both our directions. So as a presenter, we've had to adapt to online programming and, and we actually sort of adapted slowly. Like many people, we were hoping the fall we'd still be able to go ahead. So in the summer, we don't normally present anyway. And that bought us some time to make decisions and to pivot. Um, and then we went into online programming and we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, what would be appealing to our subscribers and our existing audience base. And um, when everything in the world is available, how do you decide what will appeal to, to your group of people, to the people who already come to the venue? We wanted um, artists to record content specifically for us um, so that it would be, you know, geared to our existing subscriber and audience base. And um, we were looking for, beyond audience, uh, artists recording at home. And that had been during the summer, a lot of people have been pivoting and doing that. And, and the novelty, I would say, has worn off and, and audiences are looking for a different kind of experience. And so we were asking artists to um, record in professional venues or in uh, recording studios or something like that with, with professional microphones, professional backgrounds. And so that's the kind of, um, direction we've gone for our fall virtual season and we are doing a virtual season we've done six performances and it's a mix between international performers uh national performers and local uh people and and artists and that it was that was hard too because we're used to uh booking artists who will fill a 1200 seat concert hall now we were looking for artists uh, they could be anywhere in the world. They could have any kind of um, draw. And so we mixed it up a bit more than, than we normally would. And we did want to support the local community. So we were booking local artists and bringing them into the chant to record. So the season, uh, the virtual fall season is perhaps more varied than it might be in certain ways in the kinds of artists that we could, uh, that we were booking. And as a rental venue, uh, we actually repurposed some capital funding in order to bring in recording equipment so that we could offer um, a professional environment and professional recording equipment for um, local arts organizations who were also, just like we were, we were all pivoting at the same time, trying to figure out what, uh, what this would be like. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know speaking from a Symphony 21 standpoint that the support from the Chan Center and bringing in local artists uh, really made this whole thing possible. So it's, it's really, um, really a godsend to have the Chan Center in Vancouver and to have people like you, you know, looking out for artists, especially. Um, Ron, so... Some, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead, please. I was just gonna say thank you to, for willing to be one of the first ones in because we were all learning new equipment and, and uh, learning what, the, what it would be like in the Chan Center. And, and so we were happy to have you come in and, and be a bit of a guinea pig for our new, our new recording equipment. Thank you. Well, I, I hope that we can be a guinea pig again. We're happy to be anytime. <laughs> um, 
Vaughn, so similarly, as Wendy said, you know, performers need venues, but venues need performers as well. Um, you're obviously a very busy and successful freelancer uh, in Eastern Canada, playing all over the place and are in demand for your skills. Um, as we all keep the faith that performances can resume someday, how are you staying sharp for when you get called back to the stage? Do you find it difficult practicing when there are no performances to practice for? Yeah, so I think, as you mentioned before, right now, the gold standard is digital performances. Um, and since COVID has mostly paused live performances, I've been busy like performing for my own followers on Instagram and YouTube, mostly through recordings, right? And as Wendy mentioned, like people want something that's a little bit higher quality. I've invested a lot of money in, you know, this beautiful microphone I'm speaking to right now. Hopefully you're getting a little bit of that NPR vibe. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so, you know, having that chance to bring people the highest quality content that I can. I also was a photographer and have had formal photography training. So I have a great camera that I am able to use to give people like a really crystal clear experience. Like they're almost in the room. And um, it's been really great to connect um, to people on these platforms. Um, and it's also... I do view this time as an opportunity for growth. Um, in March, I really shifted my practicing to focus on fundamentals and building technique. And I think my technique is better than it's ever been before. So that's, you know, that's always what we're aiming for. And um, I've enjoyed focusing my efforts like on learning new music and, you know, focusing on living, living composers. I kind of always ask people like, if you woke up tomorrow and all your problems were gone, like what would be different? What do you notice? And that's definitely kind of how I live my life. So I have like a five-year goal and obviously COVID is in the way of it a little bit. Um, and it, trying to see like what steps I can still take during this time to move towards those goals, even though there is this obstacle. Um, I think that I've had like so many opportunities to step away from music. Like uh, five years ago, I was in a bike accident and I broke my jaw and I couldn't play for a few months. So like I've had the perfect opportunity to like be like, okay, you know what? I've like, let's hang up the horn. It's time to do something else. And I did not want to do that. Like I'm still like as passionate about music as I was when I was auditioning for undergrad. So like I'm like, you know, still very much like gung ho about it and ready to keep going, whatever that means at this time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's like, yeah, I have some notes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I think it's just like finding what you want to do and like building yourself up and like betting on your own hard work, betting on your own talent and just, you know, keep going strong, I think. You know, mm -hmm. and the, the patience that we're, we're going to get through this, you know, it's going to take time, but we're going to get through it. Well, and watching all of your hard work, you know, as you grow your social media channels, it's, it's really kicked my butt a bit too, into, into investing more into microphones and not just going the iPhone route. So uh, I think I owe you a little bit of gratitude for getting my, getting my, getting myself in gear through this whole time. Cheers. Um, uh, Moving on to Jonathan, so Vaughn, along with myself, obviously have a deep UBC School of Music connection, um, where, as I mentioned, you're the director of orchestras and a professor of conducting. Um, and Vaughn and myself were both lucky, lucky to have benefited from our education there, culminating in, in being named to the CBC list in 2019 and 20, respectively. Um, as someone who is in charge of designing and continuing that education for the next batch of classical musicians, what are some ways that you're adapting your curriculum to the challenges, challenges of COVID? And what are the benefits and detriments of that new model, respectively? Well, I think before we can talk specifically about how we're developing the curriculum to accommodate COVID, COVID um, I feel extremely fortunate that we're actually able to offer some in-person instruction for students right now. And there's been huge efforts that have gone into being able to provide this experience for students from the Chan Center. And I know that all the faculty and the students are extremely grateful that the Chan Center has been able to accommodate the teaching needs of the university because we're one of the very few places in Canada that's able to proceed 
um, with actual in-person instruction. And there's been significant thought that has gone into the, the, the protocols for how we have rehearsal safely, how students enter and exit the building, how they get into um, a position to play on the stage. And so, uh, you know, I think we're all finding that everything takes much more time right now in COVID. And because there are all these ex um, extra protocols that, that are happening. So, you know, to, to kind of get back to your question, Jalem, when you're asking, you know, how are we adapting and designing the curriculum? I think for me, um, as someone who's teaching students right now who are aspiring music professionals, it's so important that we get back to the fundamental joy of physically playing music together. So this has been a huge focus of mine. And, you know, I think as soon as everything started with with COVID and with um, just issues uh, arising from it and want people wondering when they're actually going to be able to collaborate with another musician, right? The sense of isolationism that has come as a need for safety, which is completely understandable. It definitely has um, been problematic in terms of what's happened with how we put an orchestra together. So in terms of what we're doing, um, we've got the orchestra divided up into smaller groups right now. We're only using um, strings and it's approximately 20, 20 players at a time right now. Um, but this being said, we've done amazing things with the students. Um, we just recorded a premiere, which you very well know, Jalem, uh, yesterday of a work by Anna Sokolovich, her Il Divertimento Barocco. So that, that happened. This was a premiere that was supposed to be done by another professional orchestra in Canada, and it was canceled. So this has been a huge benefit to the students to be able to provide some sort of continuum of music making and also to promote composers and their works during this time. I've been a big proponent of of programming music of underrepresented composers for a long time. So this seemed like a natural extension of, of what we were already doing. And, you know, they're also getting a chance to explore repertoire that they wouldn't have had um, the chance to explore in a full size symphony orchestra. So for instance, you know, um, I was also trying to find programming that would that would deal with some of the social things that we're dealing with at this time. and. Uh, Florence Price, the African-American composer, um, has written many, many different works and different, um, uh, different idioms, uh, even, even works for orchestra. But I was, thought it might be fun to actually perform one of her works that was originally for organ called Adoration. So I arranged it for a string orchestra and we recorded that yesterday. Plus we're doing all kinds of other um, other works by, by in the standard canon, Bartok, Mozart. So it's, I think it's an actually, it's an opportunity for students to really explore repertoire that they wouldn't have had the chance to explore in a larger format. I think the other thing that, that's been a benefit from, from COVID and this, this whole way of how we're dealing with things is that students now have to, um, they can't sit with a stand partner, right? So all of the typical things that you'd experience as a player in the orchestra um, and having um, collaboration with another person, you can't do that. So every person has to be leading from their own chair. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's reinforcing the notion that, that orchestral music is really big chamber music and it requires such a level of commitment. So, I mean, that's just a bit of a snapshot into the types of offerings and things that we're doing to adapt the curriculum. But, you know, we've been very fortunate because um, as, as uh, leaders originally in doing live stream events at the Chance Center, going back to nine years ago when I started, we've already been using this technology. We've We've already been doing recording sessions um, and we've already been doing broadcast multicam um, events. And so it was, it's always been great to partner with the Chan Center and to see them to also now develop this capability, which I think 
you know, it, it's, it's, it's really, um, we're very fortunate because we, we had so many of these things in place before any of this happened, that there was a comfort with the technology and an understanding of what is physically required. So I, I think students are very happy to be playing right now, playing music together. We have great safety protocols in place and we're doing all kinds of um, things that are, I think, very engaging considering what we can work with under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Well, and as you said, I think the Chan Center is the most beautiful recording uh, studio that I've ever been in. So, <laughs> um, Wendy, moving back to you on that note, um, you answered my next question a little bit with, a, with our previous chat, so I'll, I'll modify a bit on the fly here. As you said, you're bringing in so many um, artists locally, internationally, that may not have been... Um, say have the history of filling a 1200 seat concert hall, but now because everything is being broadcast, there's a bit more, as I understand it, liberty or leeway in, in whose art you can bring to the public through the Chan Center. Um, in that vein, as you, yourself as a programming manager, um, do you find that the shift in model from, from how the Chan Center is engaging in the community is also shifting not just who you're bringing in, but what type of content specifically from an artistic standpoint? And if so, how is it shifting? Um, I think uh, for what we're doing, we're certainly, we've always focused on music. And I think in recording, and as you said, you know, the Chan Center is a, it's a great recording venue. Um, so we are focusing more on music and um, we didn't do theater, um, we're not doing dance. So we have done in the past through our series, we've done other art forms, but certainly um, with recording, with the equipment we have, with the venue we have, um, focusing on the concert hall, we are focusing on music um, for the, the dot com series. We do have a, um, a dance piece in the spring. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that works. But we find that what we've been hearing from people that music can make the pivot a little better, a little easier than, than other art forms, um, like dance and theater. Um, and we are finding like our, the groups that come into the Chan and, and rent the Chan, um, we're finding that we, you know, the groups that have historically used the Chan Center are the ones that have been pivoting fast. We've given them sort of a, a first dibs on on dates to come in um, but we are getting new groups coming in like Vancouver Opera is doing a series and and they're going to be so that's new for us and we are getting new groups coming in um, but again the focus is really strongly on music I am um, which makes sense for our venue but also makes sense for this new normal of recordings and um, so I think that is one advantage that music has over some other art forms for um, for this and it's if you have a good microphone um, that's halfway there for, for doing good music <laughs> recording. Mm -hmm. Just like Ron was saying earlier, you know, the investment in, in good recording equipment, that's, uh, that's a good first start. Well, and especially having been a student at the School of Music for six years, over two degrees, I can speak to how well the Chan has pivoted and, and how big of an asset um, it is for the community. Um, Ron, shifting back to you, everyone's doing such a great job of answering my questions that I'm, I'm kind of sh shifting on, on the fly here. Um, you mentioned, I didn't know actually before you just said it, that you had training as a photographer. Um, uh, and I, I wasn't aware of, of, your, of your accident, having to step away from music for a little bit. And that kind of alters my question, um, which was about needing to build a portfolio as a freelancer for a long time. Um, especially as um, musicians under under forty were told that you have to build a portfolio to be um, to be successful today and to and to be able to make a living as a musician um, to not just be a performer but to also teach and to create social media content and to uh, have your fingers in so many different pies. Um, of course, your YouTube channel um, and Instagram channel has been has been growing immensely since the start of COVID, and I know that I've really enjoyed watching it grow too. Um, how much has having this portfolio mindset helped you, um, not just during COVID, but before COVID as well? Um, and what would your advice, I guess, be to other musicians who maybe are coming out of just 
um, you know, a very singular freelance performer mindset and are maybe now looking to branch out and, and maybe don't have the same um, experience in, in creating a portfolio and, and finding a way to, to make it as a musician during this time. Sure. Um, yeah, it's really interesting because I'm like very focused on producing content, but I don't necessarily think of it as a portfolio as like per se. Um, I think that if people are like focused on what you're making, it's not like you need this like big backlog of like greatest hits to impress people. Um, I think like having a platform and having people who are dedicated fans who are committed to you and are invested in you and your success is like really important. Um, and you're going to have an easier time with that kind of like fan base. Uh, but in truth, I think that like, you know, in terms of what freelancing looked like a few months ago and what I expect it will look like in a few months, it's like a combination of networking through like playing for people and uh, putting your best foot forward in every single gig and, you know, always like, you know, your playing is your calling card. And so I think that that's like really the tried and true method of succeeding as a freelancer. And I think that's very much true. Um, I don't really perceive that I'll have like, like playing work because of my like YouTube channel or because of my Instagram. Like I don't expect like, the Chan Center to call me up and be like, all right, like, let's do a recital, right? Like, that's, <laughs> like, traditionally the way that, you know, solos are hired for things are, it's still not, like, through social media, which is totally fine. And I do think that that will change eventually. Um, and I think that, you know, showing that you have, like, a large online following is something that can be critical when choosing um, someone as a performer. Um, but in terms of like what advice I would give, I think that it's always just putting your best foot forward, no matter what you're doing. So if you're doing it online, you know, put out your best possible content. And, you know, I think also you have to balance that with like the perfectionism that's really pre prevalent in classical music and like knowing that whatever you play even at your best is a snapshot of where you are in the current moment and knowing that you're still growing and that's okay and um yeah, i think we're always our own harshest critics so don't think too much and just like post it and like it's your best like just trust that it's your best i don't know i think my my playing spoke for itself and that's why i wave a stick silently at the front uh -huh. now so, <laughs> um Jonathan, as, as an educator, do you feel there are extra skills that you need to impart on your students to help them cope with the post-COVID world? For example, the shift from teaching things like live concert etiquette to teaching how to work as part of a recording session. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think there are some real skills um, that have become necessary, especially now. Um, I think one of the things that we keep hearing all the time is we hear the quote new normal and to me this I don't know if I agree with this I think that this is the temporary normal and it's it's I don't even want to call it normal let's just call it temporary you know because I mean fundamentally people need the arts people need to be playing music arts need to be supporting what's happening in society right people that are art, are content creators need to be able to deliver in ways that have more meaning than, than some of the ways that are happening in just this purely online format. Performers need audience. That's a really critical thing. Online, it doesn't give you any feedback. All you have to do is watch any of these late night hosts who are just talking into a camera with no applause and no, no audience response and you can see their frustration with it. So, you know, I think as a musician, as an artist, I think our students desperately need to have some sort of feedback from an audience, you know? So that's one of the things that we're actually looking at is how in these next few months, might we be able to include a very small audience so that we feel that 
this art isn't being created in a vacuum. I mean, we all enjoy playing together and, you know, we all enjoy making recording sessions and students have had to increase their, their competency with technology exponentially. And there are all kinds of huge demands that are now placed on them. Some of them are taking purely online classes and we're all very familiar with the term synchronous and asynchronous right now, you know, um, but fundamentally making music is a synchronous activity in person, right? And so, so um, post COVID, I think everyone is ecstatic about the idea of being able to return to that as quickly and safely as we can. Um, and we're gonna definitely get some new skills, but there are definitely some skills in this process I will be very happy to get rid of um, when we can, we can get back to, to being artists again. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, Jalen, but you know, it's, it's definitely trying. And you know, I feel very grateful as do the students to be able to have any opportunity to make music right now. And I think it's so important to say that. And Ron, like as a freelancer, I completely feel for you, you know, looking at, um, how what's happening out there i i know that everyone who has a job right now in music feels extraordinarily fortunate i feel extraordinarily fortunate that i can work with students and to help them and to nurture them while they're in school right now and i think the people in power need to do everything they can to support what's happening so that we have a robust environment to return to as soon as we can safely do so well, and I think what you said, I, I, we're all trying to, I'm looking forward to shedding some COVID skills too. So, um, one more question for, for each of you, and, and I know that all, all three of you have been very generous with your time, so I'll try and go rapid fire through them. Um, Wendy, as someone who manages large, a large concert hall, and this is similar to what Jonathan was saying that, um, you know, not a new normal, but just temporary, um, what do you foresee as the future of similar venues all over the world? Do you think the changes we're making right now to the concert hall experience are long term? Or are we simply just waiting to go back to a time when we can return to, to normalcy? Well, I just want to say I totally agree with what Jonathan says about needing an audience, about performers needing the, the feedback, the interaction between audience and performers is, is profound. And I think that that's one of the hardest hardest things that, uh, that is missing, that the gathering for audiences, watching performers. And um, I think venues are actually doing both things. They're thinking COVID sadly may last longer than anybody thought it would. And we can't just sit back and wait. Um, so we are pivoting and doing things, but we're hoping those are temporary things, not new normal, like Jonathan said, but temporary, but perhaps longer term than we thought they would be. So there's uh, venues in um, in Europe that are putting plexi between uh, seats or groups of seats in concert halls. I know the Royal Conservatory in Toronto, uh, they are presenting a hybrid season online and small in-person um, performances. And um, so I think we are sort of hunkering down going, okay, we're going to have to put in these certain um, protocols and things for perhaps longer than we thought. But the longer long term, yes, we're all hoping we'll go back to normal. We are not uh, planning to do, you know, Chan Center Presents online forever. We're really hoping that that's eventually sooner than, as soon, as soon as possible that we can go back to our normal presenting. So I think it's both, you know, don't stop, keep doing whatever we can do, but let's shed those COVID skills as soon as possible and get back to the skills we really have, our, our solid um, base in, in presenting live performance. And hopefully it's, it'll be soon. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we all share that. That hope. Um, Ron, again, looking at, at, my, at my question list, I'm, I'm sorry to be riffing on you. We've just answered so much of, of, of what I wanted to talk about. But one thing, as you have been speaking, um, obviously, we met uh, during our time at the National Academy Orchestra um, in 2018. And I understand you returned as a, as a mentor, actually, in later years. Um, so uh, that's... That was the... That was the year I did come back as, uh, as an associate mentor, yeah. Oh, well, there you go. I, I should pay more attention, I suppose, in rehearsal. Um, but, uh, I mean, that just is evidence of, of how in demand you are, especially in Eastern Canada and especially in that Golden Triangle of, of Southern Ontario. Um, 
this whole chat has been about your your online material, but kind of balancing that with, um, as Wendy said, the importance of, of live performance and getting feedback as a performer. In your own words, what are the differences and maybe what's one thing that is unexpected about um, live performance and getting immediate feedback versus all of these wonderful videos that you're putting online and getting feedback through things like comments and, and ways that are a bit more delayed? Uh, Jellem, I'm glad you brought that up because I do think that that is a really unique way to interact with people that we haven't had the chance to do before. Um, a highlight for me was uh, a bunch of Yale School of Music alums. We put together a, a concert that each of us recorded separately, and then we put it all um, together, all these different uh, pieces, and they were watched live on YouTube, and people were commenting live as they were watching, and then afterwards, we had a Zoom reception of, like, 40 people who were watching, and they had all, like, they had questions for us and all that, and, you know, it was, it was really unique, like, when do you get a chance to have like a Q&A with that many people, you know, that's not really the norm for us. Uh, usually, you know, after we bow and the applause is done, maybe we play our encore, like we go home and we don't talk to those people necessarily, right? And I do think that there is a way to create that conversation um, through comments and, you know, I'm very lucky. I do feel very fortunate that I do have lots of students that are because of my online presence. So like, I have this opportunity to connect with people who like are already like really enjoying the stuff that I'm putting out there. And then they get a chance to work with me one-on-one -on -one and I get to like impart all this like knowledge that I picked up over like however many years. So I think that there is some, it's not the same, but there is some feedback that happens for sure in comments, I think. Yeah, and well, hopefully, I can I can sp speak from an from an artistic director standpoint that those comments when you're putting your energy into videos like we are at Symphony Twenty One, those comments really mean a lot. So, anyone watching this, uh, if you have something, comment below. So yeah, comment below, John, as John Green would say, link in the doobly doo. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to reading those. Um, last question for for you, Jonathan. Um, it's been great to hear that. When we talk about arts and especially arts education all over the world, there is always a sense of doom and gloom now during COVID. And it's great to hear that those storm clouds are not over um, UBC, which is, as my alma mater obviously is, has a very strong place in my heart. Um, so in that vein of non-doom and gloom, if you will, have you found that you, these young musicians that you teach have been able to adapt despite perhaps not as much experience as the older colleagues? And if so, um, what are some things that pleasantly surprised you about your students adapting and, and continuing to make music during this time? Well, I think, you know, it's, the students are remarkable. They're extremely willing to be flexible with things. I think that's one of the benefits of being a younger person is that you're willing to adapt to changes that happen because you've had less amount of time in what we think is this is how it is. Um, so, you know, the, I, I can't say enough wonderful things about the students. They're, they've been so flexible, they've been so patient. Um, you know, I think they're, they're really just, they're doing fantastic things, um, especially walking into them into a new situation. Many, some of these students are it's their first year at university and, you know, to experience something that is completely topsy-turvy and to have enough, um, enough conviction that this is the right way to proceed is remarkable, you know, um, but I think they, they, they recognize the value of music and they, they, like everyone does, you know, that's a musician, they realize how important this is in their lives and they want to make sure that, it, they can move forward with it. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that we're actually, it, I think it's going to be okay eventually. I think this is going to be a rough patch, but I'm confident that, you know, very soon we'll eventually be able to put things back in order. We'll have students that have experienced different things than what they would have experienced, but they'll be ready to move forward. And they're, they're, um, you know, 
the the fact that we're we can we can be making art right now and that we can actually be making music it's it's i think that's the thing that feeds us all you know when this all started um there was a lot of anxiety about how it would even work i'm i know this i'm just speaking as a faculty member right but how how are the students going to adapt um how are they going to follow protocols are we going to feel comfortable as a faculty member in front of this many students and as i said to them i said look we're all putting our lives in each other's hands here and we have to take care of each other we have to do exactly what dr bonnie henry has said for many many months and it's all about it's all about this this idea of empathy and how we respect whatever person has the whoever has the least comfort and that we're being very mindful of where they're at and you know as we started to ease back into things the level of comfort has come back and a lot of these anxieties have gone away and i think that this is going to be the general trend that we're going to see in every aspect of our lives we're going to see people who slowly reemerge into certain things that they might feel they're not comfortable with right now but eventually as we can safely demonstrate that these things are possible and hopefully as we have uh, ways to um, mitigate this virus moving forward people's level of anxiety will go down you know but i think making music automatically helps lower anxiety so we all have to keep doing that and i know the students are very passionate about that too just as i am so i think it's a great question and thank you for asking it well and it's it's great to hear that that everything is going so so well and and i know just being almost two years removed from a master's degree how important that environment is for musical development and it's great to hear that that it's continuing through your hard work and everyone at ubc um well, thank you again to all three of you for today. And thanks to all of you for watching at home and around the world, whether you are with us during this video premiere or viewing this maybe at a time when COVID is hopefully a very distant memory. Uh, from all of us at Symphony 21, we wish you the very best for you and your loved ones and for health and happiness in the future. Do stay with us now and enjoy our performance of Elgar's Serenade for Strings.